thank you very much, Alicia, and uh, thank you, Dean. Um, it's um, and it's great to see so many of you here today. I know you've got all kinds of things going on, uh, uh, sort of behind you and around you. So I do really appreciate the fact you've made made time for this session today. Uh, I'm going to share my screen now. Uh, hopefully, this will go relatively smoothly. Just bear with me for one moment. So Alicia, can you be my kind of plant in the audience and let me know whether you can see that okay and whether you can hear me all right? That's perfect, that's perfect, Russell. Looks good and we can all hear you fine. Great, okay, all right, well, thank you very much. So um, uh, Alicia very kindly said that I, I didn't need an introduction. Um, that, that's actually in part, just to be clear with you, because we agreed that I would just say a few words about RS Academics, just very quickly. Uh, I won't, you didn't come to hear me talk about RS Academics, so just 30 seconds. Um, so we work broadly in, in three or four main areas, uh, as most of you perhaps know, or some of you will know. Um, we help with the leadership of schools through the appointment of heads uh, and indeed bursars like, like Dean, as it happens, um, and uh, training of heads, uh, coaching, appraisals. Uh, we do governance reviews and so on. But probably what we're best known for is the appointment of, of senior staff. Um, we, we started out back in 2000 uh, when I set up the company in the area of strategy, marketing and research. And, that, and we still do a lot of that kind of work for schools, helping with strategic planning, which is what I'll be talking about in a moment, but also helping them with more sort of practical, tactical stuff, uh, like how they run their, uh, their admissions office or um, uh, how they kind of promote the school. So that's strategy, marketing and research. And then the third area is to do with philanthropy or, or fundraising, uh, if you prefer. Uh, so we help schools with various aspects of, of fundraising. There are about um, 85 people now who work for the company, uh, some employed, some freelance. And typically we work with between 250 and 300 schools each year from uh, Ulaanbaatar uh, and uh, Vancouver. Uh, to um, to Uppingham and Guildford uh, 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 here in the UK, so all, all around the world, but mainly mainly in the UK. Good, right. Well, enough of that. Um, uh, assuming you're still here uh, and you haven't switched off yet, I will now crack on with the uh, the main session. So, um, so this session is about uh, strategic planning, um, and as I think you saw in advance, there are a number of different topics we're going to cover. So we'll start with some some sort of some basic uh, fundamentals, if you like. Well, what is strategy and what does strategy kind of consist of? Uh, I'll share with you a few kind of principles about what a strategic plan looks like, what it shouldn't look like, what you should consider it to be uh, and what you should consider it not to be. Um, and as we work through these, I will eventually get to this step by step process. Um, so there are obviously different ways of putting together a strategic plan. Of course, there are. And, and you need to choose the one that's right for you. And you need to choose the, the terminology, the words um, that, that, are, that are right for, for, for you and your community as well. If people don't like the word mission, then, then don't use it. If people don't like the word uh, objectives, they prefer the word goals, it, it's fine. It really doesn't matter as long as there's clarity uh, in your community, in your school, as to what these things mean. So I'm not going to be at all precious about uh, how we label things. Um, and then finally, uh, and I'm hoping that we can have a bit of a discussion about this and, and indeed one or two other points, uh, we'll, we'll talk about successful implementation. Um, now, I know that uh, those of you who are here today uh, have different roles in, in different schools, in different situations. So I am genuinely very keen to hear from you at key points so uh, I'm not going to be saving the space for questions until the end. Uh, so please uh, jump in uh, at various points when I when I invite you to do so. Um, oh, Alastair Spears. That's not a relative. That's um, that's a different kind of uh, Spears. Um, but uh, Alastair, I can't see you, but hello. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, OK, so uh, let, let's start with what is strategy then so I, th I thought it was helpful I mean I don't usually like to start with kind of definitions I think it's a little bit sort of passe but the word strategy is is used a lot uh, and the word strategic uh, I'll come to in a moment because that's uh, that's the word we love to use people talk about having a strategic coffee break um, 
even maybe a strategic biscuit. Um, but uh, so we, I, I thought it might be helpful to, to, to make sure that there is a bit of clarity as to what we mean by strategy, because it is a much, uh, much used and possibly uh, abused um, word. So probably my, my, one of my favorite sort of definitions is, is this very sort of loose one. Um, a, a strategy is, is it's something about getting to where you'd like to be. Uh, or at least making the most of where you are. I think that's a quite uh, sort of honest and down to earth definition. And there's, it doesn't, um, it's no worse for that. Um, but I think, um, I think there are two key points here or three points probably. Uh, it's gotta be based on where you are now, you know, so it's not just um, uh, some kind of dream. Uh, I actually put something on LinkedIn, uh, I can't remember when it was a few months ago or a year ago, um, about a, a, an aphorism or a saying that I've, I've always wanted to, to coin. Uh, I, I have as this rather um, uh, ridiculous sort of ambition to be walking down the street or in a conference and to hear people say this, because I came up with this phrase a little while ago, which is willpower is not a strategy. And, and the reason I, I like that, and the reason I'm, I'm sort of <laughs> keen to, to tell you it is because sometimes uh, people think they can just sort of do anything they want. And if they believe in it enough, they can take the school to where they want. But it's not true. You need to make the most of where you really are now. The other key point here is it's strategy is something about where you want to get to, where you'd like to be. It's something about your, your destination or your goal or your vision. Um, but above all, it's about how you're going to get there. OK, so it's about how, how you're going to get there. So it's, it's all of those three things together. Just a few others. Um, I quite I thought this was quite, quite nice or quite helpful. Um, this one is very bad. This one I kind of cobbled together myself, um, but it's something about uh, reaching agreed objectives and how you're going to uh, pool your resources and focus uh, people and money and time uh, on getting to agreed objectives. So it's, as I say, it's all it's all of those things. Um, Strategic, I think the word strategic, although I, it's, it's, uh, I was having a bit of fun with the word a moment ago, I think the best way to think of strategic is that it helps you fulfill or implement your strategy. So if something is strategic, it helps you towards your agreed objectives. Um, it, it, it helps you reach your strategic goals, okay? So strategic doesn't just mean important or, or, or long-term or, or cunning. Um, I, I just I just say that because, as you can imagine, in my in my work, I hear the word um, several times a day um, and I just uh, wanted to get, you know, get on my high horse or on my soapbox for a moment. OK, so strategy is about how you're going to get to somewhere that you want to get to. And it's both of those is both of those things. OK. Now, this last point, spend more time on strategic thinking than strategic planning. That's kind of like an instruction to, to those of you who are, who are uh, our heads um, or uh, aspiring to be heads. Um, and what, what I mean by that, what I mean by strategic thinking, um, or perhaps uh, what is meant by strategic thinking, is reflecting on the really, really important questions like what makes your school different? Or I'm just, I've got a few scribbled down here just to, you know, I'll make sure that I don't forget any. Um, in fact, there are an endless number of important questions like this, but, you know, what sort of school do you want to be? Uh, what are you good at? What is your school good at? Um, what is our purpose? You know, what, why does our school uh, deserve to thrive uh, is, is another way of thinking about it. Uh, what kind of people are we, are we for? Yeah, these are the kind of questions that it's really, really important you spend time thinking about, uh, particularly um, in the early days of or months uh, of your of your headship, if you're going to become a head. Um, and although it's it, it's inevitable that if you're going to become a head, you're going to start thinking about these things in advance. Don't don't get too fixed on your ideas. I know it's really hard uh, not not to, but but wait until you're in the school, and I'll come back to that in, in a moment. Don't, don't go into a school thinking you know everything, because with greatest respect, you, you, you don't. You need to spend time living and breathing um, at the school before you start uh, your planning. So take time to do your strategic thinking before you actually start putting together a written plan that, that sets it all out. Just another um, 
thought um, that I thought I would uh, share with you is is this this definition here. And actually, this in some ways is a is a wonderful definition. And this comes from uh, a guy called Henry Mintzberg. I think it's Henry, certainly Mintzberg. Um, and this is kind of his way of recognizing that you can't always plan everything. And that sometimes a strategy emerges because of a common theme or a common pattern. It's perhaps linked to your values and your culture and the way you do things, or because there's a, a common sort of shared belief about what you're good at. Um, but it's a recognition you cannot plan everything. And I think at the moment that's very much um, the case, as, um, as Dean said at the end of his talk. Uh, you know, you've got some really big disruptive, uh, that, that word again, uh, big, big sort of disruptive things on, on the horizon, perhaps uh, to do with the pandemic or perhaps to do with changes in the law or, or tax regime. Um, and so if it's very hard to predict the future, then it's very hard to put together a detailed plan. Um, this sort of, uh, I suppose it's a kind of two by two uh, matrix, uh, as um, I think any sort of self-respecting consultant has to knock out a few two by two matrices occasionally. Um, and this is one I've, I've put together based on a few others that I've seen. But what I'm trying to show here is that if you have a really good understanding of your environment, so you're off to the, to the, to the right, uh, and the turbulence in your environment, the predictability of your environment uh, is, is benign. So in other words, it's not changing too much. You're pretty confident about how it's going to pan out in the future. Then you can write a detailed plan and you can follow it. But as you move away from those sort of um, uh, criteria or conditions, I should say, then you're going to need to move, as it were, higher up the hierarchy of thinking to maybe talk about or focus on your broad strategic intent. You know, so what are your broad goals rather than the very, very detailed actions? And if you really can't plan at all because the environment is so turbulent, then I would suggest, and these are just my suggestions, that you focus on your core values you know, rather than where you're trying to go. You just try to focus on what really matters to you and be really good at scenario planning. OK, so those are just a few um, kind of it's a bit intuitive that that, that matrix, but I hope it just it, it explains that you can't always uh, follow a detailed plan. So what are the main components of, of uh, strategy? So let me um, talk you through uh, some of this. Now, I'm imagining that a lot of you will be very familiar with this because you're either involved in putting together strategic plans uh, or you're involved uh, in different ways in uh, implementing them and making them happen. So I, I, I don't think anything I'm going to say is going to be particularly new. Some of the language I, I might use might be a bit new, but hopefully by setting it out in the way I'm going to set it out, uh, it, it might um, clarify some, some, some of your sort of questions or, or some of the things you, you've uh, perhaps questions you might have brought to this session, I suppose. So start with why. Now, that phrase I did not uh, come up with. Um, that is actually the title of a talk by someone called Simon Sinek. Uh, and I'm pretty sure his surname is spelt S for sugar, I-N-E-K, Sinek, Simon Sinek. Um, you can access it um, uh, on, on YouTube, I'm sure. Um, I'm sure that's where I first came across it. Um, it's a, it's a, a pretty short talk, like these sort of TED talks generally are, which I think is what it was. Uh, I think he's probably written a book uh, about it. Um, but it's, it's based on if you want to motivate people within your organization to do things, and if you want to motivate above all customers to buy things, then the best way to appeal to them and make them loyal uh, to, to your organization and whatever your organization does is to try and relate to them, not in terms of what you actually do and what you sell, but why you do it. I, I won't be able to summarize uh, or articulate as well as him the key principles. But it's this idea that you motivate people by connecting with them at a, at a deeper level uh, and the level of sort of their, their purpose. Um, he says, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And he says that most, and I would agree with this, most organizations are very, very clear about what they do. OK. Uh, most organizations, but not all, are clear about how they do it, you know, what is special about the way they do it. But not enough organizations have really thought deeply enough about why they exist. 
So focus on the why. And what that means uh, in, in your school is, is you might call it your vision. You might call it your purpose. Actually, probably you shouldn't call it your vision, if I'm honest with you, but probably call it your purpose or, or perhaps your mission. Um, and here are a few examples. So the first one, uh, and there's a question coming, OK? So I'm going to ask you a question after a couple of these. So the first one, to make education a force to unite people, nations and cultures for peace and a sustainable future. Does anybody know uh, which educational organization has that as its as its why, as its mission, and therefore uh, which schools within that uh, organization pursue that as their as their mission? I'm going to take that as a no, we yeah. don't know, Russell, rather than a yes, I know, but I'm not going to tell you. So it's the United World College movement um because i believe in that so much i'm very pleased to tell you we don't kind of publicize it on our website or anything, but we actually pay for a student to go to united world college every year we pay for their education their flights their boarding everything um and that that's a scholarship that's, that we, we've set up and paid for um so a school in the united world college there are 18 of them uh, in in the movement they don't even call it a group they call it a movement um, they pursue this and it's a pretty powerful mission uh, and it's um, I think very very motivating and it has enormous impact and implications for, for what they do and, and how they do it. The second one uh, to educate and empower each individual pupil to flourish in life and contribute positively to the world around them that's from a, a UK boarding school. The third one is from a, a very well-known commercial company a kind of consumer company a famous brand does anyone know what that one is to entertain inform and inspire people around the globe through the power of unparalleled storytelling disney yes someone said disney whoever it was you that was very good that's right who was that just out of curiosity and uh, jody jody hi jody yeah that's disney um, and the last one, I won't, I won't embarrass myself by asking you who you think that is. That's uh, something that we've come up with quite recently. Um, uh, and, and that's going to be appearing in our new branding and our new website. So the, why do we exist as a company? Because the world needs good schools and the world needs schools to, to really thrive uh, for the world to be a, a good place to live in. Um, and so that's, uh, that's going to inspire a lot of the work we do in, in, in future. So once you've kind of established uh, why you exist, or at the same time, perhaps, as why uh, you've established why you exist, you, the, the leader of the organization, with other people, but we'll come back to how you do this and who you involve later, um, you need to be um, able to describe what you're aiming for, what your, what your vision is. The word vision, though, is quite a problematic one. Um, it's, it's, it's a nice one in some ways, but it kind of suggests it sort of comes to you in a dream you know like um like some sort of some of the characters in the in the bible they have a have a vision um and that's not the right way to approach this okay so a, a vision does need to be rooted in reality uh it can't just as i said before really it can't just be some kind of uh, dream or or, or or so on it's got to be based in reality so maybe a, actually a better word might be ambition yeah, I mean, I've actually seen, I've been looking at a, quite a few uh, act, like real plans. If you could see my kitchen table here, I'm absolutely surrounded by, by school uh, plans, one or two of which uh, I'll be quoting from. Um, but uh, there's one of them certainly that talks about their ambition, and that might be a better word. So one of the schools we've worked with in the Middle East, um, the, we, we were asked to put together a strategic plan for a school in the Middle East. I, I won't say, say where. Um, and the, the board had this, uh, I would say it was more willpower than reality, but they wanted to be one of the top 100 schools in the world. And apart from helping them define what that might look like, uh, we had to also help them kind of work out how to get there. So that was their vision. And they found that very inspiring. It, it worked for them. It gave them something to aim for. Um, here's another one. It's a little bit more prosaic, but this is a real one from a, a different school, which I've not quoted from yet, to be nationally and internationally recognized as one of the premier co-educational boarding and day schools in the UK. 
the, the problem with some of these is it can be a bit kind of rah rah you know it can be a bit sort of um you know like a bit of a, a, a sort of sub substanceless pep talk um and i think for a vision to really work it's got to be believable uh it, you know people have got to believe in it it can't it they can't it can't just sort of wash over their cynicism they've got to actually believe in it um i think uh, something i was planning to say later but i'll i'll, I'll say now um there's a there's a, a French writer that some of you may know uh, called uh, Saint Exupéry. Um, I can't remember his oh, Antoine, I think actually Saint, Saint Exupéry, uh, who wrote most famously. In fact, it's the only thing I've I've looked at that he's ever uh, that I've ever looked at is Le Petit Prince or the the Little Prince. And um, years and years ago, I came across this uh, quotation um, which I absolutely love, uh, and I've written it out so I don't sort of stumble over it. Um, and this is translated, it, it's not an exact translation, but uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty close. Um, if you want to build a ship or a boat, a bateau, if you want to build a boat, don't drum up people and hand out instructions to collect and cut wood. Instead, teach them to yearn for the endless immensity of the sea. I think that's beautiful. It's quite long, but it's beautiful. Um, so he talks about la mer grande et large. Okay, so this enormous sea. People to yearn, teach people to yearn for the sea, and they'll they'll build a boat, you know, because that's where they want to go. Um, so I'm not going to ask for a discussion on this point now, but I just want you to reflect, and, and I will shut up for a moment. I'll give you like 30 seconds to reflect in in, in a moment of quiet. You know, what is the vision for your school? That's the first question, and is it exciting? inspiring and believable okay i'm not going to ask you to say yes or no i just want you to just take a moment what is the vision for your school that you're working towards you know what is the kind of school that you want to be in in say five or ten years time and does it excite you does it inspire you and do you believe it so I'll just have a think about that for a moment So if it's not, or you're, if you're not sure, then that's obviously pretty terrible. Um, but if you know what the vision is, but you, you just don't believe it or doesn't inspire you, then, then maybe just make a mental note of that. Because if you do become a head, and not everyone on this call aspires to be a head, but I think most of you are, uh, have got that in mind, or you're already a head, just um, ask yourself, well, you know, why doesn't it inspire me? What, what, is it, what is it that's not working there? Because I promise you, the clearer you are about your vision, the rest just follows like the Saint-Exupéry uh, quotation. Okay, so strategy is gonna, and your strategic plan when you come to write it down, will we'll make it really clear why you exist, what, what, what your purpose is as a school. It will describe what kind of school you want to be in the future. And it will also describe some of the values that are gonna underpin how you get there or how you behave. And I would say, I mean, you might not like the word educational philosophy. I'm not a trained educator, so forgive me if that's not the correct term. But it's sort of the principles which are going to underpin how you teach children, how you treat children, how, and how you want them to learn. So it, it's, it's a bit like um, a learner profile that I think originally, well, not originally necessarily, but it's probably best known in connection with the International Baccalaureate, but a lot of other schools have uh, sort of developed for themselves, which is great. So it's a bit like a learner profile, but it's also about how you're going to kind of develop that profile in learners. Um, so at Shrewsbury School, we've done a lot of work for Shrewsbury School over, over many years, um, and they have... Um, uh, an ethos and educational philosophy document, ethos and educational philosophy document. And, and we, uh, for what it's worth, we played a, a part in kind of the research that led to this. And they have um, the, these ones here, wisdom, kindness, courage, integrity, self-mastery and spirit. And these are actually uh, what they call their uh, Salopian virtues. Okay, Salopian virtues. Um, and character strengths, Salopian, Salopian as in of Shrewsbury, uh, virtues and character strengths. Um, and so it's a kind of like a combination of values for the organization, 
and the educational uh, philosophy that they are wishing to pursue. So under wisdom, it's broken down into things like intellectual curiosity, love of learning, articulacy, critical thinking, open-mindedness, originality. And, and, and these, it's really, really important that you as an organization or that your organization comes to its own version of this uh, in a collaborative and, and, and it can be so um, kind of empowering and exciting for everyone. Um, the second one I put there because it's something that we've developed at RS Academics and I actually used it yesterday. It, it, yesterday, it, it, it helped me do something which was quite difficult. So one of our values, um, we've broken our values down into four key areas. Um, and the, the last one uh, is, is to do with um, uh, sort of how we, how we uh, treat other people. Um, and this is a kind of subset of that. So we are honest with clients, candidates and each other. We, are, we express our views bravely and politely. Uh, and I won't go into the details of what I, what I did yesterday, but I, I plucked up the courage to tell a client what I thought of some of the things they were, they were doing. Um, and actually what was amazing is the client came back and thanked me and said um, that they'd actually come to the same conclusion. So I didn't actually change anything, but they were really grateful that I, that I sort of took the time uh, to do that. Um, so, so I think it's really important that you develop these and these will all go into your strategic plan. Let me leave you to read this. This is from the Stephen Peirce Foundation in Cambridge. This is a school where we've recently helped with the appointment of the principal. Um, this is on their website, whether it's their values or their vision or their purpose, doesn't really matter. But I think this is a really nice uh, way of describing what matters to them. So I'll just let you read that for a moment. Okay, so that's the Stephen Peirce Foundation, as I say, in, in Cambridge. If you're interested in that, you can obviously look at that in a bit more detail. And you can look to see whether they live up to that in some of the things they do. Uh, this is from a school in, in um, Victoria in uh, British Columbia on Vancouver Island, and it's called St. Michael's University School, affectionately known locally as SMU. Um, and uh, we did a, a lot of work for them, which I'll be referring back to in a, in a moment, um, but they published a document um, and, and this is what they wrote as their vision, their mission and their values. I don't actually think that their vision is a vision. That's not what I would call a vision, but it doesn't matter. They, it, it works for them and uh, they believe in it. And the process of getting to that was, was really kind of collaborative and community building. One of the things that um, the chair of governors says in his um, in his kind of introduction to the document is uh, this this plan the, the this the plan that is here will ensure that the many decisions to be made in the years ahead in all areas of school life will be guided by that clear sense of purpose and resolve. I'll just read that again. So they've done, they've done this plan in order to ensure that the many decisions to be made in the years ahead in all areas of school life will be guided by that clear sense of purpose and resolve. That is why you have this work. That's why you do this work. OK, so it's a framework within which you can operate and make decisions. Or, as Mintzberg said, it's uh, like a pattern in a stream of decisions. But in this case, it's a pattern that's kind of described in advance. So these are, are what you might call your guiding statements, yeah? Your, your vision, where you wanna be, um, your purpose, um, your values, your educational philosophy. And when you're establishing them, do remember the following things. They're not set in stone. So if you are new to a school, that doesn't mean, you know, you, you should question these things. You should question the vision. You should question the values. Values are not, um, you know, unchanging, okay? And I would suggest that every few years, every five years or, or so, depending on your kind of planning horizon, just, just check that they're still valid. Uh, check that they, they are relevant. Um, 
be sincere. I, I mean, I, I, I believe strongly that, um, you know, you need to you need to believe in what you say and put it in common plain English. Don't don't uh, talk in, in jargon. I talked about this before. A vision is not from thin air. It needs to be realistic. Um, this is actually from Simon Sinek. Uh, Martin, I, I thought it's wonderful. He said Martin Luther King said, I have a dream. He didn't say I have a plan. And he said it uh, much better than I said it. But um, the reason that Simon Sinek referred to this is that you inspire people with a dream, with a vision of the future. You don't inspire people with a plan. And I think it's just a nice way of uh, remembering that. OK, so you've got your um, your guiding print, your guiding statements. Yeah, you know uh, broadly where you're heading and you know some of the values uh, that are going to underpin your decisions. You, you've got some clarity about what matters when it comes to teaching. Um, you, you're then going to need to decide what are your main priorities or, or goals or aims. It doesn't really matter what you call them. So I've just given. So this is from this school in the Middle East. OK, this this is a real example. So they want to be the best, you know, one of the best schools in the world. They want to be in the top 100 international schools in the world. So we've said to them, well, you need to provide an absolutely outstanding holistic learning experience. And to be one of the best schools in the, you know, in, in the world, you need to have worldwide recognition. So those would be strategic goals. We've then kind of cascaded them down into objectives. We called them strategic objectives. So, for example, in that particular school, uh, a priority will be or an objective will be to provide high quality support for children with special educational needs and English as an additional language. Okay? It's not something they do at the moment uh, very well at all. We've also said that, you know, to be in the top 100 schools internationally, you need to adopt and, and nurture and develop and, and uh, uh, you know, encourage and aim for modern 21st century pedagogy. So. You know, be a bit of a cutting edge of, of, uh, of teaching and learning. And we've also said if you want to achieve worldwide recognition, you need to maintain lifelong links with alumni and, and, and these other things. So, so what you're doing in the plan at this stage is you're breaking it down and you're taking, you're, you're taking the priority. You're saying, well, what does that mean? We've got to, it's almost like they're setting the milestones. And then the objectives then translate more into more and more detail. Um, so if, I, if we just take the, um, the maintain lifelong links uh, with alumni, I've I called that B1. So there's a sort of um, uh, a bit of a kind of, you can see the, the chain as it were. So uh, in order to achieve B1, the maintaining lifelong links with alumni, you need to establish the infrastructure required to attract a large number of active and engaged alumni. So one of the first things you're gonna need to do, one of the first initiatives you're gonna need to take is to put in place a, an office essentially, a, a, yeah, a, a function. That will mean recruiting an experienced and suitable alumni officer, purchasing suitable data and, and, and so on, okay? So that's probably not, not uh, particularly new to you, but I think where these work really well is when they're set out clearly and you can see how each part links to the next. Now, in reality, those key initiatives uh, which, which are required um, need, need to lead to actions across the whole school. So it might be that they've then broken down further uh, into, for example, academic co-curricular pastoral, and that might be across different parts of the school. Um, and of course, not just that side of school, but the, the functions that make the school work, like HR, governance, uh, uh, and so on. And each of these will have their own set of uh, uh, you know, detailed actions, which cascade up, if you like, to ultimately to the strategic goals uh, and those uh, in turn to fulfill the vision. So you've got, if you like, your, your vision of where you want to be. You've got maybe half a dozen strategic goals which you need to reach to fulfill the vision. And then those will break down into objectives and ultimately into, into actions. OK, so a strategic plan, what it is and what it is not. I'm not going to spend too long on this. We've got more important things to cover, but uh, it's a framework for decisions. It's a possible path. Uh, it's a structured way to prioritize. You, that's not particularly new, I'm sure. Um, just for a bit of fun, I, uh, I, I thought I'd share. I was discussing this talk with one of my colleagues and, it, and uh, I asked him to think about this uh, with me. And he came up with the following things that a strategic plan is not. So something to decorate a bookshelf, something to tick a box. What he actually said was to pass an inspection uh, or to keep the governors off your back. A straitjacket. 
Yeah, it's not perfect. A strategic plan is not fixed. You'll need to keep checking it. As your environment changes, you need to keep checking and seeing whether you need to change your plan accordingly. And it's not the same as an action plan. Where the divide is between an action plan and a strategic plan is entirely up to you. It doesn't matter. But uh, yeah, I mean, there's no, there's no rule. I would suggest though, that perhaps in the previous slide that I showed you, that last level is, is not to go into a strategic plan. So how can a strategy energize and inspire uh, people in a school community? Um, well, I'd like to ask you that question, actually. Um, what do you think is required for a strategy to engage and inspire people in the school, particularly uh, teaching staff and, and other members of staff? What do you think is required for a strategy to engage and inspire employees? We won't have time to talk about parents and, and others, but what about employees? What, what do you need to do to engage and inspire them with your strategy? Any, um, any, that's the copy of my, uh, the week that's just been delivered through my letterbox there. Just heard it land. Um, any, any thoughts on that, please? I think it's got to interest them first and foremost. Okay. And how, how do you make sure? I'm sure, yeah, absolutely. How do you make sure that they're interested in it then? You think, Jody? Are there any? Get, getting to know them, getting to hear their thoughts. What is it that makes your staff tick? And obviously that won't be the same for each member of staff, but you've got to take all those thoughts on board. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure that makes sense to everyone. I would totally agree. You know, there's almost, I would almost go so far to say the more people are involved in it and that you, the more you listen to people, um, you don't have to do everything they say, but the more they feel part of the process of, of creating it, the more engaged they will be and hopefully inspired as well, but certainly the more engaged they'll be. Any any other thoughts, any other kind of ideas? Uh, I was just gonna say, I think the more that you can make them feel that their part in it is fundamental to the success of it. Yeah, do you mean, right, so that they, what they actually do is contributing to the overall, yeah, yeah absolutely, yeah, yeah. And that will come down to, I don't I don't think all schools get do this actually, but, um, you know, we, we, I, I took it down to, uh, you know, to some, some specific actions that could be applied in a particular department or team or, or whatever it might be. But, but the line manager of that team or department needs to then uh, make sure that everyone's personal, not everyone's, sorry, that some of the personal objectives for each member of that team are directly linked to, to the objective. You might have, um, it depends on how you have your personal objectives worked out, but you know, one, of, one or two of them might be very much to do with the person, their growth and development, mm. okay? But one or two of them should definitely be about how they are gonna contribute, excuse me, to the success of the plan. And they should know that, it should be quite clear and, and linked. And I think a lot of schools actually do that quite well, but not, not all of them. I think, I think they've got to understand it as well. And, yeah. and then be reminded of it. I, I'm embarrassed to say I've just gone on my own school's website to remind myself of what our purpose and values are. And yet I was part of the process in developing them. And I think them being, I, I know you've said they've got to be flexible, but them being available and visible in different places around the school and, and, and in different formats helps keep people on board with that engagement as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um... I mean, I've, I've captured some of those things there already, and we'll come back to some of these a, a bit later on because I've got another uh, slide later on about um, you know who should be involved uh, and, and how to make sure it's well implemented. So, in terms of the step-by-step -step process, we, we haven't got very long to, to go. Um, so, I'll just race through this. But I've I kind of assumed two things. First of all, I thought it's simplest to assume that you're a new head starting in the autumn, and obviously. Neither of those may necessarily be true. And the other thing I've assumed is that the school is not in a crisis. The school has not reached a crossroads where it needs to make a fundamental change. Now, it may be that that is the case, but that needs a different kind of treatment. So this is more of a kind of um, building on the firm foundations kind of uh, strategy, which doesn't mean doing more of the same, but it does mean that uh, you've got a little bit more time to, to think. So I would suggest that as a new head, you spend your first term looking, listening, and, and learning. Um, but perhaps towards the end of the first time, what you might wanna do is, is organize an away day for governors and senior leadership to explore 
some of these guiding statements. Um, I've got here a, a list of questions that we sometimes issue to governors and senior leadership team before an away day like that, because it can help plan the day and, and work out to what the priorities are. And we ask them questions like, how might you want the school to be different in seven to 10 years time? Or what should we not change as we plan for the future? Or what makes the school distinctive? Yeah, that's something else we do. There's also a game that we play quite often in these events, which is we get some adjectives and we ask people to vote. They can either have post-it notes or a pen, um, but they have like five votes, let's say. We put up a load of adjectives um, and they have to allocate their votes to different words. So they can put five votes on one word or they can spread it across five different words. And then we look at the words to see which have got the most votes, which have got the fewest votes. And then we come back to it later and say, well, in the future, which of these words would you hope would be more appropriate than they are today? Which of these words would you hope would be less appropriate? And it's a really great way of kind of people talking about the school and describing the school and the conversations you have uh, uh, almost without realizing help you kind of articulate what your priorities are. The research and consultation might go happen in the second term and then you might bring people back together towards the end of the year to share some of those findings and uh, establish what the main priorities are. And at that point you can write the, the guiding statements and your strategic goals. And then in your second year, this is when you, you take that out and you refine and develop and add detail, essentially. You get, uh, you get the financial plan to support the, the strategy and you make sure that the actions and milestones are, are understood and articulated in each department, okay? Uh, and then you get your budget approved so that you can start the plan. Now that might seem like a long time uh, and it really does depend on your situation, um, how, 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 how much time you give to this. Um, I don't know what the arrangements are with uh, Independent Schools Portal for kind of sharing this. I think you get a copy of the recording. Um, because I'm running over time, um, I'm going to make a, an offer to anyone who's actually here, maybe not the people that aren't here, but anyone that's here. If you wish to discuss this further, uh, I'm really, really happy to make myself available because I've, I've messed up on the time. It's my fault. So if you can spare another 15, 20 minutes or half an hour, we can arrange a conversation between now and Christmas if you want to pick up on some of these points. I'm really happy to do that. No obligation, no trick, no, no sales pitch, I promise. Um, but just to finish with, so tip on successful implementation. As the head, keep talking about the big picture. Keep talking about the mission, the vision, and what matters to you. That's really, really fundamental. Um, I, I, again, I'm sorry, to, I don't mean to hold myself up as a paragon of virtue because I get far more things wrong than I get them right. But just a few days ago, I was talking to um, a colleague and we were going to go into a meeting together and we'd need to think on our feet together. So I said to her, um, if we really think we can't help the client, you know, if we really don't think they should be ask, you know, paying us to do this work, then I said, I'm happy for you to say so. OK, you don't don't feel you've got to check with me first. You can say so because we, we, we're not that kind of we, we are that kind of company. Rather, you know, if we if we don't think we should help, we're not going to try and convince the client that we can help. So I said, be you, I, you know, I trust your judgment. You can say it if that's what you what you feel. But I reminded her that that was in keeping with our values. Use the visual representation. This is um somebody um, referred to this a moment ago um, about this is um called Colin. This is Colin the caterpillar. This comes from United World College in Singapore. And all it is, is the mission of United World College, because that's our mission, that means we've got to do these things. And if we do those things, this is our learner profile and so on. And it's just a way of tying it all together. And it's just, um, this was you know, informally known as, as Colin. Um, ensure there is clarity uh, in terms of you know, who does what. Um, I don't know if you've come across the racy analysis before. Um, it doesn't get as much attention as sort of rag, rag, you know, red, amber, green. But um, it should actually, forgive me, I hope this, I guess I'm still being recorded. It should actually be called RC. But uh, for reasons that may be obvious, um, people don't call it that. Um, so it, ultimately, someone is accountable. OK, but someone else is responsible for actually getting it done. OK, so it might be that the head of department is responsible for ensuring that their department works to the plan. 
but it'll be the director of studies who's ultimately accountable to the head, who is ultimately accountable to the board. Yeah, that's that's the idea. But it's worth thinking about that. Um, track progress, obviously, and you can do that uh, through through uh, you know, reviews of people and uh, through your senior leadership team meetings. And governors have a really important to role role to play in asking appropriate questions about uh, progress and, and progress according to plan. And then ensure individuals understand their contribution. This is a point that has been made before. Don't overload with initiatives. Um, it can be very, um, it, it can be a bit overwhelming otherwise. And then finally, it, I suppose in relation to that, is just be sensitive to the fact that if, if the strategy requires a change of heart, not just a change of action, then it, it can be quite difficult for people to come with you. So if you're a new head, I think that's another reason for just taking your time, as, as I think two or three of you said, to get to know people, actually, uh, get to know them as human beings, get to know them as educators and what matters to them, and then build a structure for actually listening to them more formally uh, towards uh, as you work towards a strategic plan. But uh, be, be sensitive and, and, and patient, I think, when it comes to managing change. That was a, a bit of a race, I'm afraid. Obviously, it's a huge topic to cover, but I, I really mean what I what I said a moment ago. Um, you know, I'm locked away in my kitchen here. I'd love to talk to you guys. So if you want to connect with me to talk about any of this, then please, you're, you're very, very welcome. Thank you, Russell. Um, I won't look at a call in the caterpillar, Marks and Spencer's cake in the same way again now, having heard that speech. Now, that was really, really interesting. And I'm sure that it made everybody on this webinar think, goodness me, how much more we need to know. Um, because obviously to talk about strategic planning in 45 minutes is now and impossible but I'm hopeful that everybody got something from that to take away with them so thanks again Russell and um, if you'd like to go you can I think um I think David just wants to wrap up because obviously Absolutely. this is day three so I'll hand over to him wonderful thank you Alicia no thank you so much Russell that was absolutely terrific um I think just like Dean Keely and Gareth I can't really believe how much you got into 45 minutes really it was absolutely remarkable so, um, so, so thank you very much indeed uh, for, you, for your time today, Russell. Uh, really appreciate that. I'd also like to thank Alicia as well uh, for putting the programme together over the last two days. Um, really couldn't have done it without you. So, so thank you, Alicia. I'm, I'm really grateful for that. I'm, uh, I'm also really grateful for, to you all as well for, for attending. I, I know how busy you are and I know how challenging uh, the circumstances are in your school. So to actually make time for your own professional development and, and to come along today. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, just to pick up on, on Russell's point earlier, all the recordings from the four sessions this week will be shared uh, along with the, uh, the presentations as well. We're actually going to create a private page on the Independent Schools portal and share that with you. So you'll be able to access everything um, in one place. And you're also freely available to share that with, uh, with colleagues in your schools as well. We're happy for you to, uh, to share this widely. Because obviously, this is, this is all good stuff that people need to see. Um, I'm also going to be sending a feedback form to you as well. I'd, I'd be really grateful if you could feed, uh, fill that in uh, for us. We're, we're actually working with the Teacher Development Agency and the Chartered College of Teaching to, to actually make our training as good as possible. And, and part of that process is, is, is sharing your feedback with those organisations. So I'd, I'd be grateful uh, if you could do that for us. And um, lastly, um, just do keep an eye on the portal. Uh, there are over, uh, there are going to be over 100 professional development events next year that are going to be delivered online for everyone from teachers to IT leads to early years practitioners. So um, do uh, do keep an eye on that. But um, I'd like to uh, say thank you. Thank you very much to you all. And uh, I hope you have a good term. Uh, this is the last portal event before Christmas. So I hope you have a good Christmas um, as well. And, uh, and thank you for attending today. Thanks very much. <laughs>